welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Global Connections. Today, we're going to address how the Iran Israel exchange has changed things, because certainly it was unprecedented. It was violent, at least from the Iranian side. And we're going to learn about lessons about their weapons and capabilities, both Iran and Israel. And for this discussion, we have Dr. Rupmati Khandakar. She's a geopolitical analyst, and she will help us understand the exchange of weapons by Iran against Israel, and then Israel's response a few days later. Uh, what have they shown about their weapons, their capabilities, their strategies, and their intentions? And how will all this change the war in the Middle East between Iran and its terror proxies against Israel? And how will it change the politics and policies of the U.S. and Europe in and about that war? We'll also discuss the effects of the American bill just passed in the Senate to provide aid to Israel. Welcome to the show, Rubmati. Aloha, Jay. Thank you for having me. And it's my pleasure to be on your show, Jay, as always. Let's take this one step at a time. What did we learn from the attack by Iran against Israel? Jay, April has been an eventful uh, uh, month for Israel and Iran. And so uh, what we learned from the Iran attack on Israel is that, you know, it was drama and Middle East politics, war played out at its best, Jay. And, you know, this is power play. This is power play. And it was uh, a defeat of uh, Iran in such a way, in a very coveted uh, way, Jay. There was nothing, uh, uh, you know, hid, uh, there was nothing uh, extravagant about it. They lost out on a war over allies. They were relying on Muslim brethren, which didn't support. They were relying on their weapons precision, which didn't strike. Um, and like you said, Jay, last time, in the last program, that it was not a small token attack that I Iran did. Iran had attacked with 100 ballistic missiles, the 170 drones, and uh, 30 cruise missiles. That's not a small number. It was by fate and by luck that Israel and its allies with Jordan, with America, with Britain, with France, with Germany, that they have thwarted the attack and reduced it from to 99% of the missiles being struck down. So that was a strike rate disaster for Iran. And to save face, Jay, to literally save face, they called it a token attack. But it was intended to hurt Israel. When it did not, they went, they went into the cover. And uh, Jay, we know Israel wanted to retaliate and um, Biden told them to take the uh, defense as a victory. So uh, in, in one way or the other, we, we spoke about that how Israel should wait to live to fight another day. And that strategy, uh, instead of overwhelming itself with an all-out all war, and exactly that happened. Instead of sending uh, fighter jets into Iran, they sent, they fired uh, missiles from jets uh, positioned west of Iran. And uh, Jay, when they struck Esfahan, Esfahan is a city in uh, um, Iran, and when one missile struck, the second missile, they... Uh, they did not allow it to strike, and they exploded it midair. Now uh, the Iranians said that it was not; it was a failure. But no, Israel uh, just gave it that the first missile struck, so they did not need to do the second attack, and they moved out. So it was such an attack which did not provoke a full-on uh, retaliation again by uh, Iran. And like you said, it's a chess game. Uh, who is moving? Who now? It is the chance of. Uh, uh, Iran to retaliate. And the, the moment they saw that Israel could come into the territory and with a single strike, strike the target, they are, they are sensible and they have said that we do not want to do it. So let's go back to the notion that um, the attack by Iran was unprecedented. So there, were, there was a military attache people killed in a building next to the consulate uh, in Iraq, uh, the Iranian consulate. Um, and it, 
is it really questionable as to whether that justified the attack that Iran took? Um, you know, and it could be that uh, the assassination of Soleiman by Israel a couple of years ago uh, sort of, uh, you know, was, was part of the historical context of this. Um, and also, I don't think uh, that uh, the Iranians were unanimous. They, did, they reached uh, some kind of agreement, but not after an argument um, as to whether to do this. And we have agreed that it was a mistake, uh, geopolitically, strategically, for them to do this. But in retrospect, what do you, what do you think the arguments were? Um, who was saying what? Um, what was the opposition, and what was the what was the hawk position on whether to do this? Can, can you can you articulate that, or at least uh, imagine it? Jay, Iran is a theocratic society, and uh, domestic problems are so huge in Iran that they need to really keep that kind of. Uh, mute it and uh, uh, you know play to the uh, play to the gallery of uh, uh, the domestic population you saw there were scenes of people rejoicing on the streets and they were saying that israel deserves what they got after they want to attack us and this was a good strike and everything now nobody went into the power play and 99% of the missiles did not hit and there was minimum damage for Israel. Now, those things were not telecast on their media. Their media is very controlled, like how China Chinese media uh, is controlled, social media, like that their national media is controlled. So they show what they want. And they showed that they had a victory of the first direct attack by Iran to Israel. That was their um, you know, war cry. And when that happened, they played to the masses. So, you know, it seems to me that this was a shockeroo for the United States, too. Here we have Iran emerging, you know, for the first time, entering into a direct, you know, military confrontation uh, with Israel. And I wonder if you think there's a linkage between the turnabout that Mike Johnson did um, and the fact that the Senate with the help of Democrats, did pass the aid bill. Because one thing is clear, that you can't keep on running the Iron Dome without replenishing the missiles that are in the Iron Dome. Um, and if Israel, you know, needs to replenish those missiles, it takes a lot of money. They're expensive. So, Query, do you think there's a linkage between what happened in terms of the Iranian attack on Israel and what happened in Congress? Um, yeah, Jay. Uh, see, the Iranian strike, which was of those 300-plus uh, missiles, uh, the, uh, the Israeli defense for it cost about $1 billion. $1 billion. Now, uh, Israel's economy, as we know, it's a war, uh, war zone, and it's not in that kind of you know robust uh, growth rate like we know it. And now the aid package that is passed, that is for around 26.38 billion, which includes 9 billion for humanitarian aid. Out of that, J, 5.2 billion is for replenishing the military uh, equipment of Israel, the, the rocket system and uh, the Iron Dome, everything. It's for that, clearly. 3.5 is to buy more advanced uh, uh, weaponry. 4.4 is for suppliers for uh, Israel and uh, 9.2 is for humanitarian aid. So this is kind of a rough breakup of uh, the aid package that was announced. And uh, Jay, America has been uh, a very strong ally of Israel and provided over total of around over 500 billion dollars. So that's the kind of uh, closeness that uh, America and uh, Israel have. There is a there's a uh, notion known as QMA, the quality uh, maintenance of uh, uh, Israel, that America is responsible for uh, keeping Israel in such a way that they can defend themselves from any provoked attack from a single uh, enemy or a coalition of enemies. So it's, you know, uh, they have thought about, there's foresight involved in America-Israel uh, relationship. 
and uh, this uh, this foresight j is the uh, engine behind this kind of funding and the bills that are passed you, you think that the um, the delay in congress would have been longer had iran not attacked israel definitely j definitely definitely see when we we were speaking about this uh, this uh, incident a couple of weeks back there was so much anticipation in us that what would happen now you, there is a, a huge country in size which has threatened to wipe israel off the map so this is not a small country like you always said that it was not a token attack they had come out to destroy israel but they they did not succeed that is their failure that is the failure of attack but the in and they had come in with the um, power j so it was america realized this as we did as the normal citizens did that uh, this attack of iran on israel will be very very uh, what do you say damaging if us doesn't help and you see the rhetoric that was leading up to it the shumar episode biden talking of come to jesus point you know all that was showing that there is distance in israel and us uh, relationship and iran is such adversary or any adversary for that uh, matter they strike when the iron is hot they thought there is a, a you know draw in uh, the us israel relations so let's take advantage of this and strike but uh, mm. this is a long standing i mean the bond is uh, not breakable simple as that so uh, looking back at iran for a moment yes we saw we saw crowds who s supported and cheered you know the attack on israel in the streets of tehran um but we know that in a theocracy or an autocracy those crowds uh, are likely to be fictitious um th that's not really a sampling of the public opinion in the country so yeah. there's two questions i want to ask you the one what have we learned about the sophistication of the weapons i mean I, they they do make that uh, that that special uh, what is it called shehan weapon um the the drones they make that and they export that they export that to russia and god knows where else um and they have missiles uh, from some source maybe they get them from north korea um and uh, let's see and they had rockets of some kind but what does it tell us about the sophistication of their weapons uh, apparently they weren't so sophisticated that the iron dome couldn't have knocked 99% of them out of the sky but what do we know now about their arsenal j uh, they do have uh, you know their strike capability is almost at par with israel but the uh, air strike capability of israel is uh, several notches higher than uh, uh, iran the standing army stands to be equal the tanks the soldiers the uh, you know the mm, but the jets and the aircraft is uh, on uh, israel's advantage more than uh, iran and that actually in modern combat that is what matters your air strike capability has to be very sharp and j one big point of contention is that israel has precision attack uh, precision uh, attack ammunition which has got you know uh, the strike rate is far better than what iran has we saw the duds that they produced and they do get it uh, supplied from china uh, and they do not have precision and it was uh, it, it was easily overcome co comparatively to what uh, israel has so the drones that they have the shaheen drones they worked everywhere else but they did not work in israel so that's the kind of uh, strike capability that they have and uh, uh, jay these people have a standing armies the distance the proximity is not so much that uh, they can uh, come into direct combat with each other that's what you know you alluded to uh, the the unrest that we have seen uh, even at distance in iran um there was that uh, young woman amin was her name uh, who was killed in police custody because she was wearing not wearing a veil 
Um, and that really excited people. And so you could see there were fractures in the society in Iran. And then, you know, Iran, in, in many ways, is kind of like a Western country. I mean, it may be a theocracy in terms of the way the government controls things. Um, but it, the, the people in Iran, if you met them, you know, they, they're kind of Western in their own way. And so query, um, you know, uh, is it being fractured? Did this attack on Israel undermine the ability of the theocracy to control the people? Or is the control so perfect that the people would not would not oppose them. Okay, the theocracy uh, of Iran is very, very uh, uh, strongly built. They they use religion as a suppressing force. They use, uh, you know, uh, conversions. One, it's Islam. Islam conquered Iran by sword. So, you know, you don't have the freedom of religion as much as any religion has to cover their uh, head up. You've seen you know, Christian Amanpur also covering the head, uh, reporters walking in, covering. You walk into, any lady walks into Iran, they have to cover the head. So that's the kind of pressure that they have. And domestically, see, when uh, Iran was in a recession, there was a growing dissatisfaction amongst the domestic uh, population against the ruling uh, mullahs or ruling religious leaders. But as soon as there has been, you know, these Shaheen drones and the oil and gas that they pumped into the international system, they got money. Now, uh, these theocratic leaders, when they have money power, they can suppress any domestic revolution. Uh, and this was just a revolution on the issue of hijab. Hijab is the, uh, the scarf that they cover. So they could easily, they have these moral policing and, you know, they have Hezbollah uh, cadets who come and, you know, enforce um, the Iranian religious leaders' mindsets onto the people. There's not much of freedom. Uh, privately, they must be very Western in their mind. Privately, they must be uh, having a very wonderful personality. But the country uh, presents a very hardliner uh, image. Very hardliner. You know, you know, it strikes me that we have terror organizations, uh, especially the proxy terror organizations around the Middle East, who train their children from virtually from birth to hate Israel, to want to destroy Israel, to want to destroy Jews. Um, but Iran is a nation state. Iran has constituencies, theoretically, that run it, even though it's kind of a democratic theocracy. And I just wonder if uh, you, we know that Iran has often said, and for a long time, has said that they hate Israel, they want to destroy Israel. Um, and of course, uh, you know, they implement that thought by activating their proxies. But query whether they really care that much. Why should they hate Israel so much? Why should they hate Israel so much as to get into a direct confrontation with Israel? This was really their initiative. It wasn't necessary. And it, to me, it reflects the possibility is of, you know, <clears throat> of questioning. Um, that is an individual citizen questioning what is going on here? Why do we hate this country a thousand miles away that we have to get into a war with them? It all sounds like irrational and unnecessary. Do you think that, that people in Iran think, or some of them anyway, think this, this attack on Israel, this, this hatred of Jews is, is, is irrational and unnecessary? Uh, Jay, indoctrination is very uh, universal in, you know, they have to uh, create this kind of indoctrination so that they follow and they obey. Now, uh, Iranians are not allowed to visit Israel. They don't get a stamp on their paper. If they come back from Israel, they are arrested. And prisons in Iraq, uh, prisons in Iran are such that they destroy the person. We all know the human rights trials that happen everywhere. Uh, they just destroy. So just visiting Israel is considered as a crime enough to put you in jail. That becomes the kind of, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the rhetoric that... Uh, the government is uh, 
the narrative that the government is setting. So, uh, you know, uh, the, what will the domestic population do? Where can they raise their voice? Uh, in theocratic societies, in, uh, in dictatorships, you know, domestic population do not have voices. They do not have opinions. They, they have something, they will keep it within, within the closed doors. And uh, um, anti-Semitism and, you know, Jewish uh, uh, hatred uh, sentiments, Jay, they are in fashion. They are pseudo-liberals. You know, so even if they like uh, like uh, Israel, they don't say it. And not talking clearly fuels. You know, if you keep silent, you're part of the crime. Mm -hmm. uh, you've heard that? So it's like that. Unless you speak for right and against mm -hmm. wrong, you are wrong. The other thing that comes to mind, just one more question about Iran, is that um, there are those who say that uh, Iran, since Trump undermined um, the non-nuclear non agreement that uh, Obama made with uh, Iran, um, that the Iranians have steamed ahead full speed to building a bomb. And we really haven't been able to stop them. Uh, and for that matter, I don't think Israel has done very much to stop them. So here we are. And some, uh, some strategists uh, say that they're six months away or less um, than having a nuclear weapon. Um, do you think that this, this attack on Israel tells us anything about their progress or their intention? of using a nuclear weapon against their one sworn, you know, like perpetual enemy in the region, namely Israel. Jay, when they started making this nuclear weapon, they declared it that they wanted to use it to wipe Israel off the map. So their entire intention was not for self-defense as or as a deterrent against somebody else's nuclear weapons. It was intended towards Israel to wipe it off the map, as clear as that. So that um, that state, everybody's got nuclear weapons. Most of the states have nuclear weapons as deterrents, you know, as, uh, you know, uh, for, uh, for, you know, entire Cold War was uh, on uh, deterrence of U.S. and uh, USSR. So everybody has, but logical uh, uh, reasons to keep your nuclear weapons. But when you're creating a nuclear weapon to wipe a sovereign democratic country off the map, that raised an alarm and everybody decided, no, Iran cannot have a nuclear weapon. If Iran had to develop a nuclear weapon for uh, its self-defense or for peaceful purposes, it was a different thing. But they are a single step away, Jay. They are just a single step away from uranium enrichment and <laughs> getting that nuclear weapon. So uh, we have to really be careful because, and I, I hope it's a dud, uh, just fingers crossed, whenever or whatever happens, it's a dud like those 300 plus missiles were, that would also turn out to be a dud. Uh, it, it's that way. Well, one other thing that um, strikes me, um, uh, you know, about the bomb is, um, she whiz. Uh, that would really um, blow up the whole area, uh, area, the region, because there would be, um, you know, consequences for Iran to do that. And um, the United States would be drawn in. Europe would be drawn in. It would be a, a nuclear holocaust. Um, that, and that word is appropriate when you're trying to blow up Israel. And Israel arguably has the bomb too. Um, mm. And so they, would, they wouldn't be tossing missiles and rockets around, they'd be tossing nuclear missiles around. <clears throat> yes. And so how, how close are we to that? Would Iran ever do that? Um, does, this, does this attack on Israel tell us about Iran's intentions to follow through on these threats? Uh. Yes, Jay, Jay. Uh, escalation is possible within a matter of moments. And uh, Jay, we have seen that Iraq and is Iran indulged in a mad, mad war for, which lasted several years. They resulted in combat. They were just fighting each other like uh, without any uh, end in sight. So they have that kind of, uh, you know, patience with war. 
you want everything to get over and done with. We want the hostages free. We want this award of terror to end. We want Hamas to end. There are goals. But these people fight for the sake of fighting. You know, what is Iran's, um, what is Iran's enmity with Israel? They have, you know, these long-term goals. Now, when uh, the Damascus uh, uh, embassy was struck, there were Iranian militants planning attack on Israel. So it was struck. So you have Iran meddling in the affairs of Israel. There is no, uh, when Israel is fighting, it fights with clear-cut uh, aim. Uh, but when I Iran is fighting, they're going to go into a long-drawn uh, this jail, long-drawn war. And because their strike was not that uh, uh, effective and the counter-strike by Israel within one missile struck the target, so they kind of muted their counter-strike. But Jay, Iran is not a, a country which will keep quiet. They will plot and plan for the next move because they are very malicious. And we see the maliciousness because of the way they train Hezbollah, the way they uh, arm uh, you know, Hamas, the way they have uh, dealt with the Syrian um, issue, the way they uh, seized the uh, Israeli ship, Jay. That was not necessary to do, but they seized it. So uh, this kind of poking would lead to a war. An escalation of drawing everybody inside is not far away, Jay, because we are living in such flashpoints uh, in the world right now. Anything can just collapse into a world war. Megan Let me throw one more thing at you, and that's, and that's this. You know, prior to 1979, when uh, the Shah was um, deposed and we entered into, they entered into a, a theocracy, um, American relations with Iran were good. And for that matter, um, they weren't um, calling for the elimination of Israel. Um, in fact, arguably, you know, they had good relations with Israel, too. So now in 1979, it all changed. And they decided that uh, the U.S. had, had um, propped up the Shah, that he was really a U.S. puppet, um, and they were really ticked off at the U.S. So there's a connection, I think, between their, their wish to eliminate Israel uh, and their, uh, their anger, hostility toward the U.S. And I almost think it's like a, a mirror reflection of the proxy thing. So they have proxies that do their bidding. And they believe that Israel is a proxy of the U.S. So when they when they talk about attacking Israel, when they attack Israel, in, in their view of it, they're actually attacking the U.S. We are equally evil as far as they're concerned. Um, is, is that still the case? Is it the case now? Um, and um, is the U.S. at risk of of um, the, not domestic terrorism, but terrorism that takes place in the United States by Iran. Jay, these um, uh, these militants, the militia, which uh, is ready to sacrifice itself um, without anything at stake, is very dangerous for terrorism in any democratic society. And the U.S. is uh, such a liberal uh, setup that, you know, we become easy targets. When a person comes to blow up, I told you, blow himself up. He is not caring about the life. And the democratic state is just trying to save lives. So if you put 20 barricades in front of him and he's walking with a, a bomb belt, he will blow up the uh, lines of defense. So this is the kind of attitude that the country also keeps that when they have decided to, you know, uh, sacrifice themselves, uh, they don't mind going into damage themselves as long as they, they hurt the other person. Their point is to hurt. Now, when Hamas came into for the terror attack on October 7th, they know they cannot fight the Israel uh, uh, defense uh, force or the government. They just wanted to hurt Israel. That is the intention of these militants, Jay. The hurting and hurting where it will last a long time or hurt very painfully is their entire intention, Jay. As a country, as an individual, 
uh, with a terrorist mind. You know, Obama had called uh, these people, uh, these few states, as the rogue states. So that stands true till now because uh, uh, they are the ones who are funding. They are the ones who are uh, propagating these uh, activities. They are the ones who are uh, um, attacking. Now, Israel attacked, did not attack the Dam uh, Iranian territory initially. They attacked the Syria, Dam Damascus uh, uh, building where there was plotting about Israel going on. So there was precision target. They did not go into a sovereign country's territory and attack. So there is a difference of provocation here. And rules of the game, they have changed so much in uh, today's world that uh, uh, they don't follow the uh, discipline of war. Let me, uh, let me uh, take it a step further. Um, you know, we have the problem on the college campuses where the major institutions are, um, the, the students in major institutions are, they're galvanizing against Israel and against Jews, for that matter. And it's, it's getting worse. What, what is remarkable is it's getting worse even after Iran attacked Israel. You know, on day one of that attack, they were out there on these college campuses getting worse. But the, clearly, the aggressor at that moment in time was Iran. And this reminds us of what happened right after October 7th. No sooner were people in the United States posting pictures of the hostages that, than people were protesting against Israel, even though it had just been attacked on October 7th. And they were pulling down the pictures of the hostages. It was completely outrageous. Now, what I'm saying is Iran would like that because Iran is sworn against Israel and it's sworn against everything that Israel does and it's sworn against Jewish people. And so when you see the crowds on the street pulling down pictures of hostages, when you see the, the students uh, all organized uh, in multiple coordinated protests across the country in multiple universities, Okay, you say, gee, Iran must love to see that, because mm -hmm. that would follow Iran's desire, um, you know, to injure, to hurt, your word, to hurt Israel and to hurt the Jewish people. Um, the question I put to you is, we, we know there's a coordinated effort here. This doesn't happen organically. This doesn't happen because 100,000 people wake up one morning and decide they're going to protest. It happens because somebody calls them to protest. Somebody sends them social media. Somebody sends them email. Somebody passes the word. So we know that Iran would be happy to see these protests against Israel. That's right in their wheelhouse. The question I put to you is, what is the likelihood that Iran, as with other proxies, is using proxies or directly involving itself in organizing and coordinating these anti-Israel, you know, remarkable anti-Israel protests all across the country, even when Israel was the victim. What is the likelihood that that is happening? They, these are pure, pure pseudo liberals. Pure me. I mean, tell you that they don't have an inkling of uh, knowledge behind their support. And when I tell you that uh, support from uh, the pro-Jewish side is not as vocal as the pro-Palestine side. It is because there are many people who are on the side of Israel but choose to keep quiet. And I really tell you that keeping quiet is being part of the crime. Being, uh, you know, you have to be vocal about your support for Israel in the same way that people are pro-Palestine. So uh, why that happened, why that even in the face of terror attack, like you have rightly said, Israel was not the victim. Israel was the aggressor. Even in the case of uh, ir the Iranian attack, Israel was not the victim. It was the aggressor. So if they have decided to call Israel the aggressor, whether, they, uh, whether any kind of situation, that means Israel is always wrong for them. And you cannot please such dissatisfied people, Jay. So uh, asking them or trying to convince their mindset that uh, Israel is being harshly surrounded by antagonistic neighbors who will 
who each one is just dreaming of a day of destroying Israel, these things are clear as uh, crystal, but they are not, they are falling on deaf ears. The Palestine protests, uh, the, uh, the pro-Palestine rallies, they have now uh, changed into, you know, uh, you have a pro-Palestine uh, uh, supporter stabbing a priest. So uh, it has gone to uh, kind of a beginning of a crusade kind of a thing. It's gone towards religion. So, uh, Jay, this spilling over of the pseudo-liberalism, they don't know where to stop. They don't know what to uh, support, what not to support. If today you and I find one action of Israel wrong, we will discuss it as wrong. We will not discuss the pros, 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 pros. We will discuss that, okay, they should do this, they should not do this. But if you tell these pseudo-liberals, uh, uh, Palestine is wrong in this, say it, they will refuse to say it. Because they yeah, you're right. Just... That's a very that's a very important distinction. Yes. Um, and, and there are many examples. We don't have the time to go into them, but there are many examples of that kind of uh, inequality uh, in terms of the way you perceive and act on the other side. I, mean, I saw an article about a woman at Yale who was mm -hmm. stabbed in the eye. So we have violence. A Jewish woman stabbed in the eye at one of these rallies. Uh, she would never stab anybody in the eye. Nobody in the Jewish side of that would stab anybody in the eye, but that's what happened. Anyway, I want to go to one last area of discussion. We don't have a whole lot of time. And that is the um, uh, American um, the American guidance, the American advice to Netanyahu. Uh, mm -hmm. There are some people who say that Netanyahu held back when he shouldn't. He, he pulled his punch. And he should have been uh, equally aggressive um, to Iran after they sent you know, three, four hundred missiles his way. Um, was that would that have been good strategy, or would that have uh, stood in the way of congressional congressional aid for Israel? Did he do the right thing by limiting his response? Uh, Jay, he really did the right thing by limiting his response because the pressure from the U.S. Uh, policymakers and Joe Biden uh, was very harsh on him. There was criticism of, of him, a very, uh, you know, vocalized criticism of him. And when uh, you have a concerted effort on the part of uh, U.K., U.S., Britain, Germany, Jordan, uh, Saudi Arabia helping against Iran, you know, there was kind of satisfaction that Israel had, but the strike, uh, the counter strike had to be there to show Iran that it can't just come in, strike, and go back. Even though Israel is fighting a war against terrorism, a counter strike was very important. But we had spoken about it; it should be to live to fight another day because there is so much of combat on so many fronts right now. So Israel has just launched from uh, fighter jets two missiles. One which hit the target in Esfahan directly, the, the facility, that the military facility, military facility in Esfahan. And the second one, they blew it up just because the first one already struck. So they gave a signal, a strong point that their single strike can strike the target. So that was enough signal for, uh, enough, uh, uh, you know, a display of uh, their strength to the Iranian side that their fighter jet, could strike from several hundred kilometers across and launch a targeted strike in the first strike. And Iran could do nothing about it. You know, I'm thinking, uh, one last thought to, to share with you. I'm thinking we agreed before we started the show today that, um, that uh, Iran, that Israel would not make a second strike now in this exchange. Uh, with Iran. And um, it is also seems like uh, it's unlikely that Iran would respond to Israel's response. That's, so things are quiet for the moment. Um, so the, the, I guess the question is, what is Iran going to do now? Because the ball is in its court. Maybe it's always been in Iran's court, you know, with the proxies and October 7th. It's, it's always been, you know, the one who creates the tumult. Um, but query, um, wh where is this going now? 
Will Iran fall back on the proxies again and activate them all the more? There are some suggestions that is that is their strategy right now, that they're not going to engage in direct conflict with Israel. They're going to just go back to the way it was and, and maybe foment more unrest with the, with the proxies. Or, or is this direct exchange thing part of the landscape now? We know that um, you know that each one of those parties has has fired weaponry into the other, and maybe that's a, a sort of a its own kind of escalation. Um, so will that happen again? What do you see in the short term and the intermediate term on this? You are so right about this that the the direct combat will be uh, you know uh, rested for some time because. Iran saw the kind of response that it got. You know, there were six big allies who came to defend Israel. Iran went into this thinking that Israel had fallen alone. So uh, that was their mindset. And when they saw, you know, Jordan, Jordan out of all the countries giving them the, uh, and Saudi Arabia giving them the refueling facilities. These are countries who are concentrating on the economic growth rather than, you know, uh, uh, religious Bretton Hood. So uh, they want to be, Saudi Arabia fights for regional supremacy. And Iran, by engaging in a, uh, you know, a f combat with Israel, will risk its ambitions of becoming a regional power. It was a cash-strapped uh, uh, nation, and now it's got the money. They don't want to waste it in war. They want to make the theocratic military setup more stronger to suppress their domestic population, which is very pro-Western uh, uh, civilization. So they have another agenda domestically. So using that same uh, money to indulge in a combat with Israel. See, now Israel is being provided funding from the US. Iran does not have that kind of uh, facility of uh, having a very strong ally. And uh, uh, to keep that kind of uh, mentality of a war going in, I think, uh, throughout the history, they have just been in war, mostly. So uh, again, engaging into a war with Israel, they will not risk that. And uh, on, the, on the front of, uh, you know, uh, strengthening uh, these proxies, they are, they are, very, they are pros at it. Hezbollah thrives on Iran. Shia Sunni gone to the dustbin, and this is just uh, hit Israel, hit Israel, hit Israel all the time. And they feel that is better for them. That is a better option for them. Yeah, well, in including hit Israel elsewhere through yeah. other proxies, even in this country. So yeah. and the one thing I get out of this conversation is that things are different now. This yes. direct exchange made things different. And, and one, of the, uh, one of the effects of that, seems to me, is that, is that Iran has come out. If you were not sure of the level of control they exercise over the proxies, you, you're more sure of that now. And if you're not sure about how much they hate Israel and the Jews, you're more sure of that now. And if you wondered whether they were truly, really a rogue state, um, a theocratic rogue state, you're pretty sure that they are. So I think they came out of this, if you look at it the way the world perceives it, especially Europe and maybe other places too, and the Congress, um, they're, they got a black eye. They have come out of this with a black eye. And our original point was they made a mistake here, not realizing what kind of a black eye they would have. Anyway, um, great discussion. Uh, Ramani, thank you very much for joining me on this. Uh, we've been talking about how the I Iran uh, Israel exchange has changed things, and we agree that it has, maybe in ways we don't yet understand, but we know those ways are profound. And we know there are lessons that have been learned and will be learned and are to be learned about their weapons, their capabilities, and their intentions. Thank you so much, Rupati. I hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much, Jay. Aloha. Hope to be back very fast. Aloha.
Aloha. We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.